Good morning. I'd like to read from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40, the uh, passage relating to Jesus coming to Jerusalem and being heralded as king, where we read, after Jesus had said what he said, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives. The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Let's bow for a word of prayer, Lord, as we look to your word and remember this uh, event that is celebrated every year as Palm Sunday. We pray your blessing upon our reflection. May we hear from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some things just simply need to be said. If you're like me, and I'm sure you are, there are occasions arise when keeping quiet would probably be the safer option, but you just have to say what's on your mind. You're so worked up over whatever it is, your opinion you know, can't be suppressed for even one more moment. Uh, when I was thinking on that, uh, it reminded me of that passage uh, where David says in Psalm 39, uh, verse 3, my heart grew hot within me. As I mused, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Or uh, as a living Bible translates it, the more I thought about it, the hotter I got, igniting a firestorm of words. Most of my work these days is in ethics. So expressing my opinion where issues of justice are concerned is quite common. It's my job to raise alternative possibilities. And more often than not, when I'm involved in these discussions, expressing that perspective, it's a good thing. But that having been said, man, the fires I have lit in my life because I just had to say what was on my mind, the crow I've had to eat, the fences that I've need, needed to mend, I can't speak for anyone else, but I know all about a firestorm of words, and I know how thinking about things can quickly translate to fussing about things and completely change the dynamic. Sometimes what David describes as a hot heart is more of a hot head, and it's important to know the difference before you go off saying too much. Uh, but not only can we say things that we should not and regret it, we also can say things we do not believe because we're caught up in the emotion of the moment. Uh, I'm sure that as an example, uh, many of the Canadians who occupied Parliament Hill to protest the health mandates knew exactly why they were there and what the message was they were sharing. They were, so they were, they were invested in that perspective. <clears throat> they were there for the right reason, even if it was not considered the correct reason. But there were others who simply saw a crowd gathering, thought that a hot tub and a beer garden might make the experience more wonderful. And they're paying the same price now as those who uh, occupied that area. Crowds are fickle. And often crowds are more about a sense of belonging and shared experience than a sense of purpose and shared vision. I know that not everyone who attended the January 6th riots in front of the Capitol building in Washington, DC. Uh, I, I know that not all of them actually had a clue uh, what the political issues were. I think it's good to know the difference between 
these possibilities as well. When we are convicted about something and when we are parroting because everybody else is saying it or doing it, and ensure that we know the thickness of the ice before we decide to drive our truck out onto it. If the crowd didn't cry out on this occasion, the stones would have. That's what Jesus said. But Jesus is talking about something very different when referencing the role the stones might play in his triumphal entry. Well, Jesus was acknowledging the importance of his mission in Jerusalem, the things to come, his rejection, his passion, his death, all of those things that he spoke about throughout his early ministry. Stones crying out, in this case, was hyperbole. Uh, that was to indicate the appropriateness of the public welcome that he was receiving. He was saying that the events to come were not to be experienced in private, but fully visible to the entire city. The very stones crying out was not an admission that his ego needed stroked or that he required the adulation of the crowds as it is often said by people who are critical of this. It was affirming that this moment was a moment for the ages and it would not happen in obscurity. It was his expression of absolute confidence in what was about to come. I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. But I'll say, I've heard some real strange interpretations of the Screaming Stones aspect of this uh, text over the years. Uh, one rather literal fellow suggested that the stones were like these little tape recorders making records of everything we say. Uh, he pointed out how stones are everywhere and they're listening and they're recording it in order to play it back on the day of judgment. The uh, referenced in support of that, the practice of uh, building epinetsers or the stone pillars the Israelites would pile to acknowledge contracts and agreements. You read about this in many sections of the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, we know them as Ebenezer's. Uh, Ebenezer or Ebenezer is more close to what the Hebrew would be there. Uh, so yes, uh, Ebenezer Scrooge has a name that literally means pile of rocks. Uh, so this, this fellow believed that stones were going to be our accusers on the Day of Judgment. And uh, so he quite literally saw them as placing us between a rock and a hard place. Now, it's rather comical when you think about it, but once we step into that realm of faith, reality has a whole different texture to it. Uh, for many, the laws of physics or the general principles of science are not appropriate lenses for evaluating spiritual material as God is not limited by such laws and God can act apart from them. Uh, we call it a miracle when that occurs and miracles are a well-founded belief in Christian circles and intercessory prayer because of a belief in miracles is a universal practice. We believe as Christians, God can and, do, and does move in ways that uh, we do not understand. Uh, what God does and does not do in the affairs of humanity however, is a mystery, and we must simply leave it at that, uh, recognizing God will do what God will do or not. And we must be content, as it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2, to let God be God and let our words on earth be few. What we find when we look at the crowds lining the streets on Palm Sunday and compare it with the one assembled on Good Friday is how the group think occurring was vastly different on those two occasions. Now the Palm Sunday groupies wanted to crown Jesus as king, hail him as the victor, you know, if not the Messiah. The Good Friday mob wanted to crucify him. So in the space of a mere five days, a complete reversal in how they were viewing him. So from a group think perspective, and both of these were all about that, group think. Good think is when a, a more powerful perspective line, you know, is put forward and, and all the sheep line up behind it. Uh, so this was a group think uh, moment, not a rational objective uh, uh, evaluation. And both of these crowds, uh, because of that, were ill-informed and wrong. Palm Sunday was probably more in line with the moment and what it was calling for, an acknowledgement that uh, Jesus was king. But their motive really had nothing to do 
with the mission of Jesus or what Jesus came to accomplish. Uh, in verse 37 of that passage we read, it indicates they were praising not because of any of that, but because of all the miracles they had seen. They were not cheering that mission or declaring allegiance to the good news or the kingdom, God, uh, the kingdom of God. They were applauding his performance as seen on Judea has talent. It's just about the same in terms of uh, what inspired them. And perhaps they were hoping a little magic remained to do something amazing for them. You know, uh, prove to me that you're no fool. Walk across my swimming pool as the King Herod song and Jesus Christ superstar said. Uh, Good Friday, on the other hand, was about how that same crowd re reacted when they discovered there was no additional magic forthcoming. And, you know, people can get really nasty with their heroes when they feel let down, which basically underscores that it really never was about the hero in the first place, but them and their perceived wishes. And, and this is the problem with hero worship. Heroes almost always let people down in the end, even when that hero is God, because we don't get to decide what the hero is going to do, nor do we really always understand what the hero can do. We set some arbitrary bar and decide if the hero cleared it in our perspective. As I watch the scores of people trying to escape Ukraine and find safety in other places, I wonder what kind of prayers they are praying. When I imagine uh, the people that are huddled in subways and basements and whatever nooks and crannies they can find while the bombs rain down, I wonder what kind of prayers they're praying. I wonder if uh, those who made it out had more effective prayers than those who died along the way, or if those who died or got injured forgot to add something important to their prayer, like in Jesus' name. Often we hear descriptions like that for why people's prayers do not work. And, you know, in that sense, did not work. Or maybe, just maybe something else is going on. Something we can't reduce to our own failed expectations. I will not pretend to know the ways of God or explain why some feel delivered and others feel abandoned in these moments. But I can say, after more than 40 years of ministry and much of that with some of the most vulnerable people in society, people with a severe and persistent mental illnesses, is that deliverance and abandonment are common things when God is viewed as hero. And whether you feel delivered or abandoned depends entirely on what happens to you and where the bar for sensing God's presence is set. I mean, who among us hasn't prayed and experienced some disappointment when what we thought could happen did not happen? Imagine how that a conflict plays out when it's your very life that is on the line. Palm Sunday and Good Friday are two poles on the same continuum. A Holy Week hope continuum. A story of hope arriving and hope being dashed, with, in both cases, hope being defined by what the hopeful wanted to see. That's the key. Hope in both cases became expectation and an expectation, a uh, misapplied sense of being blessed or failed with neither conclusion accurately capturing the spirit of the moment. But that does not make the need for hope any less important. It simply underscores the importance of holding on to that hope a little bit longer. Uh, when my brother uh, Gilbert was 13 or 14, he got this bright idea to paddle a rubber dinghy from the beach on Northwest Basin, you know, that little sandy area uh, on the beach just across from what was Jack and Pearl's at the time. I think it's a jug city now. Uh, he wanted to paddle out to Red Dock. There was still a swimming hole there then, and I guess that was his intent. And as he tells the story, he got nearly halfway out into the bay when the dinghy sprung a leak and completely deflated, and he found himself... Uh, um, in the water fully clothed with shoes on, no life jacket, and from the point he was not sure which way was closer to shore. Now, I probably would have kicked my shoes off and tried to lose my pants, but he decided to head back 
to the Northwest Basin side fully clothed. Uh, when I was younger, I was on swim team for a short time in Pittsburgh. And then later, my exercise was to uh, go to the Y at lunchtime and swim a half mile every day. This is when I was down in uh, pastoring a church in Ohio. I can swim forever in a calm pool with little current or resistance. I know the various strokes. I find swimming in Georgian Bay eminently more, eminently more difficult, uh, particularly when the waves are rough and the wind is blowing. Swimming in the bay is much different than swimming in a temperature controlled uh, swimming pool like at the Y. Makes me really admire my father who when he was 18 jumped in from the town dock in Penetang and swam all the way to Northwest Basin with someone trailing him in a boat to make sure he made it the full distance. Um, I'm, if I did that, it would probably take me eight hours. Anyway, Gil, uh, Gilbert, my brother, was not a competitive swimmer per se, and uh, the challenge before him, fully clothed, was no easy feat. So off he went, battling the wind, battling the waves, willing each stroke from his primal desire to live, and probably the lack of better options. You know, you do what you have to do. The more he swam, the more tired he got until finally he says his arms were so heavy and his hopes so deflated that he resigned himself to drowning and he just let go. And fortunately, he sank into like three, three and a half feet of water, stood up and walked the last 50 or, 50 or so yards to shore. I've shared this story as a metaphor for hope since the day I first heard it because it involves assessing the crisis and believing that you can conquer it, uh, making a plan, acting on that plan, drawing on the required resources you need and using them to the best of your ability, pushing through the doubt and the weariness. And when it feels like you have nothing left to give, finding the means to give just a little more. And if you don't find the means, occasionally finding out that what you thought was not enough actually was, uh, which is what happened with, uh, with Gil. Hope requires action in order to be reasonable. It is not merely a wish. That's my point. Hoping a boat comes by or a large bird scoops you up is not enough in most cases uh, to deliver you and would not have been for my brother. Hope acts on what can be controlled and leaves the rest to God. Now, that's really how we conquer anxiety is, you know, anxiety um, uh, is all about loss of control. So controlling something helps us to deal with that. And uh, the wonderful thing about acting on hope, particularly where God is concerned, is that believing God will strengthen us can increase our strength all on its own. Confidence increases our strength. Uh, I played football as a quarterback uh, when I was in high school in the States. And one of the things I quickly learned is that holding back and absorbing someone else's energy was the quickest way to be injured in football. The key to success in football is to make sure that the blow that you're delivering is equal or more powerful than the blow you are receiving or the blow you're absorbing. And once I figured that out, I ran with confidence and I trusted my process and experienced a whole lot less pain as a, as a result of that. Timidity, timidity and tentativeness are not rewarded qualities in football, but they're probably not better rewarded in life in general. Uh, confidence in football is what faith is to life. It's controlling what we can control and leaving the rest to powers greater than ourselves. Expecting a miracle is not hope. In fact, in some cases, it's more a lazy gamble than faith. Miracles may come, and it's wonderful when they do. But they are more rare than the common experience and cannot be expected. That's why they're called miracles. Hope is trusting that your actions will be enough and acting accordingly. And even if they're not enough, one is generally better off than uh, we would be if we were just passively sitting on the dock and waiting. We want hope in times of crisis and hope in such times often focuses on a hero. And for many that hero in crisis is God. 
and apparently for others these days is Volodymyr Zelensky. And whether he is or he isn't, I see in him a man who's confidently swimming for shore and trying to do what he can, which is about all one can do in these circumstances. Who can say, though, what people will think about him tomorrow? I've seen lots of heroes turned on uh, down the road. And no theological spin can make the horrors of war more, more palatable. What one thinks about God or God's involvement in human affairs is a personal matter. What God does or does not do in the affairs of humanity is a mystery and I'm comfortable leaving it at that. The larger question may relate to our own expectation and responses. How are we responding in the face of this human tragedy with the options available to us? How are we contributing to what we see as the common good? in this crisis? And I know that there is no easy answer to that question. I know what Jesus did. He went to the cross and died. That was the card that he had to play in the situation he found himself, and he played it. Some are making a very similar sacrifice in these times as well. Maybe they feel that's the only card they have to play to protect their families. We learn less about theology at times like this than we do about ourselves. Human beings are on both ends of this conflict. And God will do what God will do or not. And the rest is left to you and me and the prevailing will of the human family. I hope we can find a way to act together and, for heaven's sake, to keep our heads above water.